the celebration by so many people, people that I think are relatively smart and relatively aware for the most part, the celebration of Elon Musk's announcement, public announcement that he had a desire to purchase Twitter has really exposed a blind spot that I wasn't even aware was so pronounced. I guess I probably shouldn't be surprised after the last two years, but I wanted to do this video because this blind spot, unrecognized, represents a, an existential threat to humanity. Now you might say, Elon Musk buying Twitter? What's the big deal? What are you talking about? I think really the problem is it's a lack of vigilance preceded by a lack of understanding of what a true totalitarian dystopia looks like. So let's start talking about what a totalitarian dystopia would really look like as far as we could tell, the logical progression from the place that we are now. And then we could talk about what Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter would look like. Knowing nothing about some sort of a shadowy conspiracy or anything like that, but just knowing Musk the man and Musk in terms of what he has done in the past, his history, his temperament, and also his incentives around Twitter and the platform that it is today. In terms of a totalitarian dystopia, if we want to know what it would look like, the logical progression, I think what's very helpful is to see what humanity has resonated with in terms of the possible depictions of a totalitarian dystopia. This is generally going to be in movies, other content that's uh, either video, some sort of storytelling, literature. When we look at these things, obviously, we can have some lesser examples, like, for instance, the British series Black Mirror, which hit with a lot of people. But I'm thinking if I had to take two big examples out of the last 100 years that have resonated with people at such a deep level that even people who are not fully aware of the content are actually able to even quote some things from out of it and recognize it as a representation of, let's say, the quintessential dystopia. I'm thinking really of two works. One, Orwell's 1984, written in 1948 or published in 1948. And the second is The Matrix, the very first Matrix movie done by the Wachowskis. I remember that first Matrix movie, pfft, Talk about a red pill. For me, I was young, and I, I think I was probably about 20 years old when that came out, maybe 21, 22. Had a massive impact on me, as it did with so many people, where they, they recognized there's, there's a truth in here. There's something very true, a kernel that's resonating with me. There is a matrix. There is a matrix. And in 1984, obviously, this one, this is a, a literary classic. And over the last two years, certainly, we have brought up all of these things. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, which is the motto of the uh, Oceania government, the party. And also this saying, we are at war with Eurasia. We have always been at war with Eurasia. If you haven't read 1984, I absolutely suggest reading it. And when you do, if you're familiar with The Matrix, if you haven't seen the first Matrix movie, I don't know, you've been under a rock, watch it. The two of them together have a common theme that runs through them. And the common theme is that a dystopia, what really defines a true totalitarian, frightening dystopia, terrifying, is that the, those in control, be it some party, or be it some machines, and it's important that it's these machines because the party itself, as we see in 1984, is very much a machine. The way that the protagonist Winston describes the party and the government and the things that are there, it is very much a machine unto itself. 
that even those at the top of it have no real control over it. They are just as much prisoners. They are just as much cogs in the wheel as anyone else. And this is very heavily explored in 1984 in Orwell's book, all of the strata of society and how they are all really beholden to the machine. And this is also, of course, true in The Matrix. The important part about 1984, and which is why you have to read the book, because you can't get this in the movie, is the idea of linguistic control. There's a concept called new speak that has gone into quite a bit. And one of the inventors of new speak, or one of the linguists who's working on new speak, says that the, it, with the eventual project of this particular language that they are introducing slowly, the end point is that people will only be able to even think certain things. You won't need to censor because the total set of things that people are even able to think will have been set. This is something that people, they can't get their minds around, especially those who operate under the idea that they have free speech that they are actually the ones who, who control what they think and what they say. So those who are being censored because they say particular things, none of those things have come from you. You've received them from outside of you. And actually, if you go through and you look at like political stances or your stances on any given issue, you will note that you have a very limited set of opinions that you even know exist. And you can only choose from those. And the person in control of the set is the person in control. Because if both the left and the right, if both of the things on the table serve the person in control because they have built the set, then it doesn't matter which one you choose. It's the illusion of choice. The illusion of choice. And so this is just the nature of reality, period, that we have a limited set of possible options from which we can choose. Where we have to be vigilant in terms of preventing the dystopia is to not allow a scenario where there is an entity or force, a power or principality that is in absolute control of that set. And that's what the matrix represents. That it's actually in control because it's jacked into your head of what you can see, feel, smell, taste. This is the, even the taste part is explored in the matrix. The moment when Cypher wants to be put back into the matrix and he goes in and he's eating the steak. And he says, I know this isn't steak. I know it's not real. I know that it's just a computer program, but it sure does taste it. It tastes like it. And he says, ignorance is bliss. Put me back in the matrix. I'm tired of eating that, re that tasting what real food in the real world tastes like. I would much rather be eating this thing that I believe to be steak. And there's a, a deeper issue here, even deeper than propaganda, which is crude. So propaganda, Edward Bernays, also the inventor of uh, public relations, Edward Bernays came up with this idea of propaganda and then changed the name to public relations. And that is really more about a particular issue and what you think or believe about the issue. But there's even a step deeper than that. And this is what's explored by Rene Girard, the concept that's called mimetic theory, but that he began early in his exploration of it, calling it triangular desire. And the first principle that he operates off of is you don't come up with your desires. You don't come up with what you want, things that you want, what you find valuable, that you actually have an urge to go out and acquire or to consume or to look at, that doesn't come from you. It comes from other people. Basically how he says it works is 
you first value an individual for some reason, you set upon them, and this could be a hero, what we would call a role model. You pick a role model. And then you look and you see, what does my role model want? And then you want that. He goes further, Rene Girard goes even further, and he says that eventually you actually become an enemy of your role model because your role model is competing for that which you want. So they're actually become a, they become a hindrance, even though it was from them that you even got the desire in the first place. And so this has been used in the last hundred years, along with the things that Bernays came up with, along with PR, and this is part of marketing. So this is part of the marketing game, and this is how a celebrity spokesperson works. This is why they have athletes and actors and singers, these people that others look up to. Oh, they like this car? Therefore, I should like this car because they are a role model to me and I desire what they desire. They think this woman is attractive. I should find this woman attractive. This is very, very important. And it goes directly to Elon Musk and his particular relationship with Twitter. And then knowing Elon Musk, why his control of Twitter should be set off all kinds of red flags for you about its potential for introducing the type of totalitarian dystopia that is discussed in The Matrix, where your entire sens sensual sensory reality is controlled by an entity. That is what you are even able to perceive and certainly what you are able to believe about your world. And also 1984 by the words that you are even able to speak the thoughts that you are even able to formulate. Those are fictional depictions of a, a common idea. So how does Elon Musk use Twitter? Why is Twitter valuable to Elon Musk? That's the first thing. He's offering to purchase it. He would like to purchase it outright and take it back private into his control. So what does that tell us? That tells us Elon Musk values Twitter, the platform, and he would like to be in control of it. He values being in control of it. Well, why does Elon Musk find Twitter valuable? Do you think that it's because he's such a great defender of journalistic free speech, as he says? Or is there something that's maybe a little more obvious that we could look at? Don't go by his words, go by his actions. If you wanna know what someone believes, which is no different from what someone values, then you go by their actions, not by their words. How has Elon used Twitter? Elon Musk is an influencer. And if you've been around cryptocurrency, one of the ways, and it was interesting to watch him with Twitter, Elon with his tweets was able to move markets and he was able to create triangular desire. He was able to drive demand. And it's like, it's almost the prototype. It almost makes me think that this was a grand, a more grand plan, but I don't, I actually don't think that there's some grand conspiracy. I just think that this is what Elon does and who he is. And this was a foregone conclusion based upon his temperament, his history, his personality. When Elon started tweeting about Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin went up. He then moved to talking about Dogecoin. The important thing for people who have been who have not been around crypto, but that people who have been around crypto know was that Doge was made to be basically not valuable. A meme coin that was just there to kind of show that it could be done. It's a joke. And that it's not supposed to be valuable. It's not supposed to really be used for anything per se, except for fun, for lulls. 
It's a meme coin. And he starts expressing that he likes Doge, that he desires Doge, that he finds Doge valuable, that he wants Doge to go to the moon. And what happens? Triangular desire sets in. Those who look to him as a role model then see the price go up. Now, what's interesting is there's a feedback loop because those who had already saw him as a role model start driving it up. But then when people see the price going up, their impression of Elon Musk as someone who can move markets and be an influencer then makes him a role model even to them if he was not a role model before. Do you understand the feedback loop of a role model? Because really it's like, oh, I want that. Then those who want power, who want wealth, then they start looking to him as a role model and he becomes the world's richest man after, after that thing. It was Bezos at the time. I don't even, I don't know if he was even in the top 30, but then he becomes the world's richest man, world's richest man which has a feedback loop of role model again. Now he's even a bigger role model. And now if you look at the response to him buying Twitter, oh, he's some kind of hero. Now he's some kind of hero and he could just say, oh, I'm doing it for free speech. But why does he want it? What would be valuable? People would say, oh, it's so he doesn't get canceled. He's not gonna get canceled. He's not doing, he's not doing anything political. He's not going against the narratives in a way that's going to get him canceled. He's not vying for political power, which if you've been watching videos that I've been doing, it's a misunderstanding of political power. This is the Vaisha age. He's a, he's a quintessential Vaisha, and the power that he's using is the power of influence, marketing, PR. These are the tools of the Vaisha to control. And if he can control what you desire, he doesn't have to censor you. If he controls what you're even able to think, he doesn't have to censor you. And so, not even needing a conspiracy, let's just look at Elon Musk's history and what he does, what he's interested in. What is he interested in? Systematization and automation. Look at his companies. Systematizing and automating things that are highly complex and quite difficult and that have needed a lot of human interaction and human participation. And by so doing, getting great efficiencies and profitability. So what would that mean for taking over Twitter? If he was in control of Twitter, he would have full run of all of the data created by Twitter. He already, you know that he's been thinking about what it is that is the mechanism behind being an influencer. What is the linguistic tools in order that he does a tweet or a series of tweets or builds up a campaign of tweets over time and he can look back and say, ah, that's how I was able to turn a meme coin and make it go up for no reason, just off mimetic theory. Now I want you to imagine that systematized. I want you to imagine individuals that you thought were real people, or maybe at a certain point, you don't even care. That's even crazier, but they're actually bots. And those bots say the things that you have always thought. And those bots desire the things that, you, hey, I actually want that. Oh, and isn't this interesting? And isn't this fun to follow a bot? This isn't even a real person. Look, oh, look at how they're talking. Oh, this is, yes, but th they're saying exactly what I want them to say politically, sports commentary wise, from a standpoint of fashion. Oh, it's providing me, th it's the greatest music. Yeah, the television show represented, that, that was um, recommended by this bot. At a certain point, you just say, who cares if it's AI? And this is what Twitter as a platform would allow to be built. 
we already take our recommendations for the videos that we watch on YouTube from a bot or on Netflix or in a search result. Now imagine political opinions, cultural ideas, and then add to that the ability to sell that to the same people who are customers of Twitter now, right? Advertisers. Imagine the capability to sell to McDonald's the idea that, hey, what do you want? You want your sales to go up by, give us a number and give us a location. Okay, pay this amount of money. Type in what we want. Okay, in uh, California, Southern California, we want McDonald's. We want it to go up by this amount. We can track the whole thing. We want their sales to go up like this. And you press the button and the machine itself learns over time what's driving, 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 driving demand. And it creates that demand ha by hacking our brains, which is another business that he's doing, isn't it? Neuralink, literally reading people's thoughts to the degree that they can control something. Imagine that you have the capability to utilize all of those things. He's got machine learning in his Tesla cars, right? They're, they're taking in data as they travel and they use that data ingested to do the machine learning so that they can drive better later. You've been training Google's self-driving cars every time you use a CAPTCHA. Ever wonder why it's always a view from the road? Click on the three, click on any of the pictures that are a bridge, click on any of the pictures that are a bus, click on any of the pictures that are a traffic light, a crosswalk. It's using you to train their AI. It will be your tweets that are used to train the AI influencers that then go on to control the total set of things that you're even able to think, that you're even able to desire. And you will be unable, unable to prevent it because it will have, it will have unlocked aspects of your psyche. It will have unlocked desires in the same way that a drug. You don't have any control. Once the drug is in your system, it's just going to interact. We're talking about mimetic drugs here. And this is why it isn't so simple. This is why it wouldn't even take, and it doesn't even take some conspiracy, some consp grand conspiracy theory to understand why Elon Musk would find Twitter valuable and then to just extrapolate what he would do if given control of Twitter because it's the same thing that he does if given control of anything. Systematize and automate that which he finds valuable, influencer. And he's got machine learning staff. He's got AI staff. This is why people should take a look. You need to be vigilant and you need to understand what the totalitarian dystopia actually looks like. It's not jackboots. It's not people knocking down your door. It's not censorship. There's not a need to censor something that you can't even think. If I can control what you want more than anything, I don't need to censor you. I just make it so that you saying something that is opposed to what I want takes you further away from that thing that you desire. I just point you in a direction and put up the guardrails and you're a rat in a maze going after that cheese. So be careful. That's what's coming, be vigilant, because that is on the way. It's guaranteed that it's on the way. Whether it's this particular thing, who knows? But be vigilant because that's what is approaching. That's what this age is about. And the war is on for your very soul. And if that to you, does it make it clear that, that what is at stake is your soul? I don't know what will. So... Stay vigilant.